This is Laser Berman from the Times of Israel, and you're watching Rabbi Doug. We're going to see Rabbi Doug. We're going to see Rabbi Doug. We're going to see Rabbi Doug on your TV tonight. But Daddy, I want to watch Monday Night Football. Forget about Monday Night Football. There's no other thing we're going to watch on Monday but Rabbi Doug. Yeah, Rabbi Doug on TV tonight. We're going to see Rabbi Doug. Oh, how many talk about that? Shalom and welcome to Taped with Rabbi Doug. We are here outside RZC Mizrahi in Skokie, the religious Zionists of Chicago. And we have a special guest today, Laser Berman. He's a diplomatic correspondent for the Times of Israel. And he is here in Chicago. He's going to share with us uh, much information since October 7th. And he's also here just uh, days after the Iran bombing of Israel with drones and missiles being sent. And he's going to comment on that as well. You won't want to miss this episode, so stay with us right here on Taped with Rabbi Doug. Laser Berman is a diplomatic correspondent for the Times of Israel, where he covers the war in Gaza and Israel's ties with the world. He fought in the Gaza Strip in Khan Yunus as an officer in Division 98 and in peacetime, flies abroad with senior Israeli officials, including the Prime Minister, to cover their meetings with world leaders. He holds an MA in Security Studies from Georgetown, he was, uh, one of his teachers was Rabbi Moshe Semkovich. <laughs> Got a connection to the Chicago School uh, And even though we just met him now, we, we feel that he's just a wonderful, wonderful person, and we're very happy that he's here. Uh, and he's going to share his thoughts with you, and there'll be time for questions and answers. So, without any further ado, please work. Thank you, Rabbi Eisenberg. Thank you, to Mizrahi. Thank you, Dr. Laxer. Um, thank you for all of you for coming. It's a Sunday. I know uh, taking a couple hours out of your Sunday is not a given, um, especially with Pesach so close. I'm sure some people are here to kind of get away from the uh, Pesach cleaning a little bit, so I understand that as well, but it's a good place to be and it's a good topic to be talking about. I wish we could be talking under happier circumstances. Um, you know, it'd be nice to come here and be talking to you about a recent trip I did with the Prime Minister, or talking about a new agreement with another uh, Arab country, maybe Saudi Arabia. Um, but if we are going to be talking about the uh, topic of October 7th, what led up to it, uh, the event itself, the aftermath, I think it's a good time to be doing it now. It just marked six months. Um, that's six months since Israel changed since many of us changed, I certainly changed as well. Um, a reminder that many of the things that we thought were behind us as a people um, are still things that we have to deal with. It was a reminder that there are tens of thousands of people right on our borders that are spending all of their time, resources, energy, and talents trying to figure out new ways to get at us and kill us. That there are hundreds of thousands, if not millions of young people, very well-to-do young people from very comfortable places in the world that are willing to spend their time marching to make sure that it's as hard as possible for us to have the legitimacy to defend ourselves. And of course, it's six months that um, 134 now um, hostages are held in conditions that we can only imagine, even though we don't want to imagine. Um, so I think it's, a, it's obviously an important topic to talk about. Let's go back a little bit and let's talk a little bit about the lead up to October 7th. We'll start with Hamas as an organization. History of Hamas, kind of very quickly, some of the highlights. 1987, um, there was, it's, it was an offshoot of the Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood. Um, it started out really as kind of a dawa, a charity, and religious, what we would call Kiruv organization. Um, trying to add more of a religious element to the struggle against uh, against Israel. Now, it, it started in the Gaza Strip, and just in general, when you look at Palestinian politics and development, things tend to start in the Gaza Strip. So the first intifada, when Hamas came about, was started from the Gaza Strip. Um, 
Uh, when Arafat came back into the Palestinian territories, it was Gaza, October 7th, Gaza, Hamas um, rules the Gaza Strip. That's where really things, in terms of the fight against Israel, start. The first attack that Hamas carried out was, somewhat appropriately, a kidnapping. Kidnapped two soldiers in 1989, drove them, <coughs> made in Gaza, there was no border or anything like that, no fence. Uh, one picked up one near Ashkelon, one closer to the center of the country, murdered them, and drove back into Beit Lahia. That kind of set the tone for the uh, future of the organization. But the vast majority of the victims of Hamas in the early years were not Jews, were not Israelis, but they were Palestinians. The focus was on targeting Palestinians who were not living the right kind of uh, religious lifestyle, or uh, especially Palestinians who were seen as collaborators with Israel. Now, don't think that there was any sort of evidence or trial or anything like that. It was people who were suspected, whether it's doing business, whether it's settling scores. Uh, brutal, brutal story. And one of the leaders of this effort to find the collaborators was someone named Yechis Sinwar, who we know now as the mastermind of October 7th and the leader of Hamas in Gaza. Um, Sinwar, brutal, brutal character. Uh, we know he's a monster, but he was known before that. There are Palestinian families in Hebron who tell the IDF, when you catch him, please drop him off in Hebron. We have a long score to settle with him. Don't worry, we'll do things to him that you would never do. Um, so there is certainly a long memory of who this person is. He spent 20 years in Israeli prison, learned fluent Hebrew. His Hebrew is probably almost as good as mine. You can see interviews with him in Hebrew. Um, and he was released in 2011. 2011 was the big Gilad Shalit deal, right? Gilad Shalit uh, kidnapped by the Rafah Brigade. We'll talk about them, the Rafah Brigade of Hamas. Spent five years in Hamas captivity and 1,026 prisoners, amongst the many hardened terrorists, were released. One of them, Yechia Sinwar, the lesson he learns from this is that if you kidnap Israelis, they will pay a big price and they will free. Um, they will free hostages, no, hostages they will free prisoners, they will free hardened terrorists. That is the lesson that he learns, and he also comes out of that experience with a sense of obligation toward the people that he sat in cells with, that I will get you out. Um, now, let's talk a little bit about kind of Israel's approach to the Gaza Strip over the years. Israel comes into control of the Gaza Strip twice, 1956, about eight months of control during the uh, operation uh, Kadesh, give it back to Egypt, and then in 67, Israel takes it along with Sinai, the West Bank, East Jerusalem, and the Golan Heights. By the year 2000, when we pull out of Lebanon, the Israeli um, idea and the concept is that there's no point in hanging on to territory that, uh, that has a hostile population in it. It's much preferable and much more advantageous to pull out of these places to get behind walls. We'll talk a little bit about the development of that, that, of that concept, but the idea is let's pull out, and in 2005, Israel pulls out of the Gaza Strip entirely, uh, every last soldier and civilian. 2006, Hamas wins the Palestinian legislative elections, and in 2007, they, uh, launch a surprise attack on the PA forces in the Gaza Strip. Okay, now here's something that you won't read about anywhere because it hasn't been written. Uh, I was a soldier in 2007 in the Gaza Strip. The initial orders as Hamas started their attack was that the IDF would defend the PA forces against Hamas. And then the orders came down to pull the IDF out. It's an internal Palestinian fight, let's not get involved. Um, and obviously that was a major mistake because perhaps the IDF could have stopped the Hamas takeover of the Gaza Strip and everything that happened afterward. Just a sense of who this organization is, after we were pulled out, um, I was in charge of the Israeli force at the Arabs crossing in the northern Gaza Strip. Hundreds of Fatah, Pierre family members fled into the crossing to try to get into Israel away from Hamas. If they had gone back into Gaza, they said they would have been killed. And it took a couple days for Israel to figure out what are we going to do with this hundreds of Palestinians? How are we going to get them to the West Bank? So they were stuck in this crossing. 
At some point, Hamas send, sent in two gunmen to start just shooting all these civilians, throwing grenades, um, and it was my forces that that uh, chased them off and had to treat the, uh, again, Palestinian Gazans who were the victims of this Hamas attack, just to give you a sense of the of, of who Hamas is willing um, to target. Now, when, we're, when we kind of fast forward to October 7th and we ask, okay, what was Sinai thinking? What was he trying to do? So one of the things that, he, came, he took power in 2017 of, of the Gaza Strip. Um, became the Hamas leader there. One of the things, obviously, as I said, was the prisoner thing. He felt like he needed to get those prisoners out of Israeli jails, and the way to do that was to kidnap. There's another uh, bizarre kind of piece of evidence that has come to light in recent weeks. You can read about it at memory if anyone, anyone reads that site. They have the protocol. There was a meeting in September 2021 that Sinwar led, which was about the liberation of Palestine. Now, that might be, okay, this is what they always talk about, it's a fantasy of theirs, very nice. This meeting was different. At this meeting, they started dividing up the liberated Israeli cities to different Hamas governors who would run them, right? So someone got responsibility for liberating Tel Aviv, someone for Haifa. Um, there was even a Fatah, uh, a very respected Fatah official who lived in Gaza, Hamas people respected him. He has since fled to Egypt, paid his way out of the Gaza Strip after October 7th. But they said, called him and said, do you want to be the governor of Rehovot? That's where his family originally was from. We'll let you run Rehovot after we, we liberate it from the Jews. He told them, you guys are crazy. Don't talk to me anymore. Like, I don't want to hear any of your crazy ideas. But it, it shows you how kind of messianic and out of touch with reality, in many ways, um, Hamas under Sinwar's leadership was. Just if you're wondering what would have happened to the Jews under this crazy plan, uh, it's very similar to the Nazis in the 1930s. People like me who are kind of useless to the good of society would have been killed immediately. People more useful like doctors, engineers, they would have let them live and you know serve the, the, new, the new Hamas Palestinian state. Again, very reminiscent of what uh, the Nazis thought. So I think this really indicates what Sinwar was thinking and what he thought he could do accomplish, at least in stages, but starting with October 7th. Let's talk about our side. We talked about the enemy. Let's talk about um, what Israel thought and what Israel was preparing for. If you think back about the IDF and the big victories that Israel has had, 56, 67, 73, that was from a certain classic security concept, that it's a small country, you have to call up the reserves, we have a lot of strategic infrastructure right near our borders. The way we win wars is not to, we're never gonna uh, you know, conquer Arab countries and, and change their politics, but what we can do is defeat them militarily very quickly. We, uh, we get advance warning of their attacks, we either preemptively strike or we very quickly call up the reserves, bring the fight into enemy territory, win the fight, and then they understand that they're not gonna defeat us militarily and they uh, are willing to trade land for peace. That's what happened in 67, even in 73. But Israel started moving away from that classic concept. 1973, the Yom Kippur War was very bloody, over 2,200 casualties. Um, there was a crisis between the soldiers and the, the leadership. How, were you, how did you let us become attacked and surprised, very similar to October 7th? Um, and people were less willing to, uh, to accept that they could be casualties in war. And Israel started looking up, looking around for a different type of warfare. Luckily for Israel, at the same time, America was looking for the same thing. America had come back from Vietnam, didn't want to think about fighting guerrillas anymore, started looking at the Soviets again and understood, oh, we have a problem. The Soviets will always have an advantage in terms of the tank divisions that they'll have in Europe. If we try to meet them, NATO tanks against Soviet tanks, we're always going to have a disadvantage. Let's start looking to our advantages, which is technology. They started developing precision strikes, intelligence, airstrikes to take out the tanks. And that type of approach of revolution in military affairs, you might hear it as RMA, was very appropriate for Israel. The same type of advantage. It was seen as potentially a bloodless type of victory. Um, wars in the 1990s, whether it's Kosovo, it's the first Gulf War, only uh, 
uh, strengthen this perception that this is the type of warfare to go to. So this is what Israel started investing in, in its operations in the 1990s. There was no ground maneuver. The ground forces stopped maneuvering. It was all from the air. And this is indeed what you can see in Israel's operations 2006 in the southern Lebanon, in the first, uh, excuse me, the second Lebanon war. The only use of ground forces was as a last resort. The air has failed, so let's finally put in ground forces at the end. And then we fought this whole series of operations against Hamas in the Gaza Strip. Now, these operations were not meant to defeat Hamas in any way. Defeating Hamas in the Gaza Strip was seen as way too costly, bloody, and why would we want to reassume responsibility for two million Palestinians that don't like us? Again, the trend in Israel was let's get away from territories where there's a hostile population, let us build defenses, walls, the Iron Dome, and let's hunker down behind them. Whatever happens on the other side of the wall, they can do what they want, but we'll be safe behind our walls. We fought Operation 2008-2009, that was cast lead, 2012, 2014, protective edge. Every time we're telling ourselves the other side is deterred. Are they deterred? We fight another operation in 2018, 2019, 2021, 2022, 2023. It doesn't seem like the other side is very deterred. They are willing to continue to challenge us and they feel like their um, approach is working. They double down on what they're doing. They double down on tunnels, they double down on rockets. It's not like the Arab armies that we fought in the classic days of our victories, where after every war, another Arab country would, would understand they can't defeat Israel and would either stop fighting or sue for peace. They doubled down on what they were doing. Now, the last time there was an Israeli plan to take over the Gaza Strip was in the year 2014. That was Operation Protective Edge. The commander of the Southern Command, Sami Torjaman, uh, he had a plan called Sela Eitam. It was a very aggressive plan to take the Gaza Strip. It would be Gaza City and Rafiyah, Rafa, at the same time. We'll talk about that in a minute because it's relevant. And the rest of the Gaza Strip it would be cut into four different parts. Within two weeks, the IDF has taken the Gaza Strip. The civilians stay in each sector and move toward the beach. And then the clearing of the terrorists within the cities begins. A very aggressive plan, very different than the way we fought. But that plan was canceled in 2015. From 2015 to 2024, there was no approved plan within the IDF for conquering the Gaza Strip. Now, when I heard about this, I was very surprised. I assumed the IDF had plans to conquer, I don't know, Saskatchewan, just you know, in a drawer somewhere, and any conceivable thing. It was certainly conceivable that the IDF would have to go back into the Gaza Strip, I thought. It was not a plan. Now, you might say, laser, what's the matter? So what, there wasn't a plan. It's a commitment of the plan. If there's not a plan, it affects the way the IDF builds itself. IDF is a poor army, gets a ton of money, but it still doesn't have enough money. Every shekel that goes toward intelligence in the Gaza Strip means it's not going toward intelligence, let's say, against Hezbollah, which was a much more pressing threat. So if we think that we're not going to go into the Gaza Strip, and from 2014 again, there was no plan to do so, we're not going to invest our intelligence in what goes on inside the Gaza Strip in terms of militarily. We care about the rockets they can shoot at us. Okay, there's intelligence about which units are firing rockets, where the rocket warehouses are. There is plenty of intelligence on that. If there is a tunnel going under the border into Israel, there's intelligence on that, and we would attack those ones for a while. But if there's a tunnel going from the center of Khan Yunus to the north of Khan Yunus, why do we care? We're never going to go there anyway. They can dig all they want. Let them dig, right? Not our issue. It also affects the way that the IDF is structuring itself. If we never think we're going to have to go and deal with multiple tunnels at the same time in combat, then we don't have to build techniques and technology, and certainly not in massive numbers, to do so. If we have a couple of units that can do it, and they can be these boutique units, and if we find a single tunnel coming from Gaza toward Israel, we can take that unit and they can do, you know, they can do it and take their time. But we didn't create enough of these units to do it in a war. It affected the way we built ourselves. Other things were um, 
were an offshoot of the, what we expected from the Gaza Strip that affected what happened on October 7th. Some things that seemed very small but were, but were very decisive on the day. The vast majority of the fighting on October 7th, at least in the morning, was done by the Kitot Konanut. These are these small squads of people that live on the Kibbutzim, that are 12 to 15 people, that their job is to uh, jump to any sort of, uh, if there's any attack, they, let's say there's three, four terrorists coming in, these people jump, they deal with it until the army comes, the army will definitely be there within a half hour, don't worry about it. The army started telling these Kitot Konenu to reduce their numbers. You don't need that many people. Go from 20 to 12. Why not? They started limiting what kind of weapons they could use. They started saying that the people in the Kitot Konenu, in these teams, couldn't keep the weapons in their house because they could get stolen. Now, at the time, the vast majority of thefts of weapons came from army bases, not from these people. So that means the weapons had to be kept in a centralized location in the center of kibbutz. And believe me, Hamas knew where these places were. Other mistakes that were made. Um, all the forces around the Gaza Strip are commanded by the Gaza Division at Re'im. Re'im is about well, two kilometers from the Gaza Strip. If it's two kilometers from the Gaza Strip, it means it is vulnerable to attack. Right? And it doesn't help if it was 10 kilometers from the Gaza Strip. It could still do its job ju do its job just as well of commanding the forces in the area. The fact that it was two kilometers from the Gaza Strip meant that it was close to attack, but it didn't give it any advantages. And not only was the division headquarters there, right next to the division headquarters was the brigade command, the brigade headquarters for the northern Gaza Strip, and the brigade command for the southern Gaza Strip. So basically, all of the command of the forces in the Gaza Strip that needed to be doing the command of the forces as the attack happened were right next to each other, very close to the border, and as we know, they came under attack in the beginning of uh, the day. Let's talk, now you've all seen what happened on October 7th, I don't need to go into the gory details, but I do want to point out one instance which, uh, which is kind of the extreme case of the dysfunction um, kind of the worst case of, of the uh, military response to what happened. And that is kibbutz Nir Oz. Nir Oz is small kibbutz, 1.8 kilometers from the Gaza Strip, about 400 people. Um, and I'll <coughs> give you just a sense of the timeline of what happened there, and then you kind of get understand, get a sense of how, um, again, this is the worst case. Other cases were done better, but it, gets us, it gives you a sense of, 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 of the collapse of that day. So 6.29 a.m. is when the missiles start to be fire, fired uh, from the Gaza Strip. We had assumed, by the way, the whole time that the Hamas's main effort was the missiles, the rockets. It turned out the whole point of the rockets was for Israel to put its heads down, go into bunkers for their main effort, which was the ground attack. At 6.43 a.m., so that's 15 minutes later, there's already the fighting at Re'im at that division headquarters. That means the division basically stops functioning as the body that's supposed to start managing the battle on the ground. At 7.15 a.m., you start to get reports in the Kibbutz WhatsApp groups. Why is there Arabic outside my house? I saw people on motorcycles inside the Kibbutz. The people in the Kibbutz know what's happening pretty early on. But again, since the main headquarters are fighting for their lives at the time, they're not able to get, get a sense of what's going on. 824, so about two hours into the attack, the first drone strikes, Israeli drone strikes happen within Israel, and they strike Nachal Oz. Now Nachal Oz is two things. It's a uh, kibbutz, and it's also a military base. The first drone strikes are to protect the military base. Now, it could make some sense, right? That once, if the military is able to function, then, then they'll be able to more quickly take, it, take control of the situation. But when you talk to civilians, let's say Nachal Oz, which was also under attack, the fact that the Air Force is going to protect the army before the civilians adds to the sense from that day that a lot of civilians feel like they were abandoned. Um, 843, that's when you get the first reports from the Erich crossing in the north that soldiers have been kidnapped. And the first time something flies over near Oz, 
was 904. Okay, so there's helicopters that fly over near Oz. 904 is two and a half hours into the attack. They certainly see smoke coming up, they certainly see the fire, but there is no report from them on any radio that there is any attack on near Oz. It seems to be, um, it's just not getting through to the higher command. The first time an army radio says anything about near Oz is 10, 15 a.m. So it's basically four hours into the attack is the first time anywhere on the military radio network mentions this kibbutz, which is full of terrorists at this point, and they've, they're deep into doing what they're doing. By 10.30 a.m., the division has kind of retaken control of the base and is starting to divide troops and more orderly send troops around. And by 12.30 a.m. p.m., you have masses of IDF troops coming down to the Gaza border area and starting to go into the, to the kibbutzim and starting to take control of the situation. However, by 1 p.m., so we're talking six and a half hours after the attack starts, the terrorists leave near Oz and they have not seen any IDF soldiers when they go back to the Gaza Strip. Okay? The first IDF soldiers come to near Oz at 2.15 p.m. Um, and then it goes in Shayette, two special forces come, and there's no terrorists there for them to deal with. All that they can do is start um, literally laying out bodies and start helping civilians evacuate. In February, at the four-year anniversary of the killing of Qasem Soleimani, who was the leader, the legendary leader of the IRGC killed by the Trump administration, ISIS carried out a twin terrorist attack in the heart of the country, killed over 80 people. Uh, that certainly did not make the Iranian regime look very strong, and especially to its people. The people in Iran do not like the regime, um, and it's always worried about some sort of revolution and wants to look strong to its people. It's, it's very Iranian to kind of have rules of the game, tit for tat. The F-35s that killed the general came from the base, they wanted to hit the base. They didn't knock out the base at all. The base is still working. You can see pictures. There's some kind of holes in the sand. Very good. That was as, as, as good a bit as, 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 as far as they went. They injured one Israeli, seven-year-old girl, Muslim, uh, a wonderful reminder to the region that it's not only Jews who are threatened by Iran. And they succeeded in taking Israel from the center of world opprobrium, the, 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 the discourse in the West, in Europe, in the US was suffering Palestinians, we need a ceasefire. The ceasefire was no longer conditional on the release of hostages. That was what people were talking about. So if I'm gonna leave on a, on a or end my, my prepared talk on a good note, the IDF is as strong as it's ever been. Um, it's as prepared as, as it's ever been. I think the results of what happened on Shabbat prove that. Um, there's a lot to learn. October 7th will be a, a, a scar and a stain for years to come. Um, but from that, uh, a lot of strength has emerged in the country, in the military as well. Um, but it's something that we're going to be dealing with for many years to come, and this is our generation's fight. Well, that's it. I want to thank Religious Zionists of Chicago, Mizrahi. I want to thank Laser Berman, and I want to thank everyone involved in today's program. And I want to thank you and remind you, you can check out our website, www.tvrabbi.com. We could also see former shows on the web. If you want to email us or email Laser or anyone uh, involved in this program, I'll be happy to forward it to them, and I know they'll get back to you. The email address is info at tvrabbi.com. Hope to see you next week, same time, right here on Tape with Rabbi Doug. Shalom, everyone. Gonna see Rabbi Doug. Gonna see Rabbi Doug on the TV tonight. This has been a Taped with Rabbi Doug production.